during which Cornelius gazed at me with embarrassing insistence. I could read his thoughts only too well. Had it not been high time for such a feeble race of men who gave in so easily to make way for a nobler breed? I blushed and looked away. I have a child. Nova has given birth to a boy. I know he is a splendid baby, but it is a month since I last saw him. The security measures have been tightened still more. Zira, who is suspect to the authorities, is under close surveillance. Cornelius has many enemies. He dares not frankly proclaim his discovery. Even if he thought of doing so, his superiors would no doubt be against it. The Orang Utang clan, led by Zayas, is intriguing against him. They talk about a conspiracy against the Simeon race, and point me out more or less openly as one of the factionists. Cornelius is looking for me. There is something serious he wants to discuss. I follow him into the office where Zira is waiting. Her eyes are red as though she has been weeping. They seem to have bad news for me, but neither of them dares to speak. My son? He's very well, Zira abruptly says. Too well, Cornelius mutters with a frown. He smiles. He cries like a baby monkey. And he has begun to talk. At three months old? I am delighted. Zira is annoyed by my doting father manner. But don't you realize this is a disaster? The others will never leave him at liberty. Your son is going to be placed in a sort of fortress under the surveillance of the orang-utans. Zayas has been intriguing for some time, and he's going to get the better of us. I am dumbfounded. It is not possible to leave my son in the hands of that dangerous imbecile. It is not only the child that is menaced, says Cornelius abruptly. I'm very much afraid that within the next two weeks the council might decide to eliminate you, or at least remove a part of your brain on the pretext of some experiment. Zira puts her hand on my shoulder. You must get away. You must go back to where you belong on earth. Your son's safety and your own demand it. Her voice breaks as though she's on the verge of tears. I am also deeply upset. No less at her sorrow than at the thought of leaving her forever. But how to escape from this planet? Cornelius has a plan. Your spacecraft is still orbiting round our planet. An astronomer friend of mine has tracked it down and knows every detail of its trajectory. Now, listen. In exactly ten days' time we are going to launch an artificial satellite... Manned by humans, of course, on whom we want to experiment the effects of certain rays. No, don't interrupt. The number of passengers will be limited to three. One man, one woman, and a child. You three will take the place of the passengers. I've already got the necessary accomplices. The others won't even notice the trick that's been played on them. I take the opportunity of thanking Cornelius with all my heart. Inwardly, I'm wondering why he's doing all this for me. He reads my thoughts. Zira is the one you ought to thank, he says. It's to her you owe your life. On my own, I don't know if I should have taken so many risks, and anyway... He pauses. Zira is waiting for me in the corridor outside. He makes sure she cannot hear and quickly whispers. Anyway, for her as well as for me, it is better that you should vanish from this planet. He closes the door after me as I leave the room. I am alone with Zira. I take her in my arms. I see a tear coursing down her muzzle while we stand locked in a tight embrace. We are about to kiss like lovers when she gives an instinctive start and thrusts me away with violence. While I stand there, speechless, not knowing what attitude to adopt, she hides her head in her long, hairy paws and bursts into tears. Oh, darling, it's impossible. It's a shame, but I can't. I can't. You are really too unattractive. We have brought it off. I am once again traveling through space aboard the cosmic craft, rushing like a comet in the direction of the solar system at an ever-increasing speed. With me are Nova and Sirius, the fruit of our interplanetary passion.
We have been travelling for more than a year and a half of our own time. Nova is bearing the voyage extremely well. She is becoming more and more rational. Her motherhood has transformed her. She spends hours doting on her son, who is proving to be a better teacher for her than I was. As for Sirius, he is the pearl of the cosmos. He walks despite the heavy gravity and babbles without stopping. The sun is growing bigger every moment. I try to distinguish the planets in the telescope. I can find my bearings easily. I can see Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, and... And the Earth. Yes, here is the Earth. Tears come to my eyes. I know after seven hundred years I shall find neither parents nor friends, but I can hardly wait to see proper men again. We have entered the atmosphere. Nova looks at me and smiles. My son stretches his arms out and opens his eyes in wonder. Below us is Paris. The Eiffel Tower is still there. After seven hundred years' absence, I managed to land at Orly, which has not changed very much, at the end of the airfield, fairly far from the airport buildings. A vehicle approaches. It is a truck, a fairly old-fashioned model, four wheels and a combustion engine. I should have thought such vehicles had been relegated long ago to museums. The truck stops fifty yards from us. I pick up my son in my arms and leave the launch. Nova follows us after a moment's hesitation. She looks scared. She will soon get over it. The driver gets out of the vehicle. He has his back turned to me. He is half concealed by the long grass growing in the space between us. He opens the door for the passenger to alight. He is an officer, a senior officer, as I now see from his badges of rank. He jumps down. He takes a few steps towards us, emerges from the grass, and at last appears in full view. Nova utters a scream, snatches my son from me, and rushes back with him to the launch, while I remain rooted to the spot, unable to move a muscle or utter a sound. He is a gorilla. Michael Maloney was reading the final part of Planet of the Apes by Pierre Boulle. It was abridged by Jane Purcell, produced by Chris Wallace, and was a watershed partnership production for BBC Radio 4.